Good morning. Welcome to worship. I love to hear all this chatter before worship. It's an opportunity for the fellowship of God's people, and it's good to see each other and come together and worship this morning. Welcome, and it's a day to gather. It's a day to remember. It's a day to celebrate. Uh, today is Pentecost Sunday. That means uh, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God poured out His Holy Spirit upon the church, and, and the fact is we're here because of that. We're here because the Spirit has come. And God empowers uh, Christ followers around the world to uh, stand in the light of day and to rejoice in the goodness of God and to celebrate His amazing grace. The psalmist sings, This is the day the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, and long have many people said within the liturgical uh, calendar that this is the day the Spirit came. And let us rejoice and be glad in that as well. I invite you to stand as we open our time and worship this morning. We're going to sing together, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
in the sure and certain hope that Christ shines in this world and through the Holy Spirit shines upon God's people and through them as well. We gather this morning to receive also God's blessing as we begin and continue this time of worship together. I receive God's blessing at this time. Grace to you and peace from God who is our Father and Jesus Christ who is our living Redeemer and the precious, wonderful work of the Holy Spirit which blows like a gentle fire in the hearts of God's people as they worship this morning. And together God's people say, Amen. In the Apostles' Creed, we profess the words, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. As we continue our worship, I invite you to join me as we profess what we believe when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit. These words are found in Article 11 of the Belgic Confession, been formatted in a question and answer. I'll read the question. Let's read the answer together. What do you believe about the deity of the Holy Spirit? We believe and confess also that the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but only proceeding from the two of them. In regard to order, he is the third person of the Trinity, of one and the same essence and majesty and glory with the Father and the Son. He is true and eternal God, as the Holy Scriptures teach us. This is our faith. The Holy Spirit is true and the eternal God, and by faith we know that apart from the Holy Spirit, we would never know what Christ has done for us. But thanks be to God. He gives us the Holy Spirit. and We rejoice in this and do that with me together this morning as we continue in our worship singing, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God.
You may be seated. It is in the work and the wonder of the Holy Spirit that we come not only to worship this morning, but to intercede and pray together. And a couple prayer requests to uh, make you aware of if you haven't received our email updates. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Dave and Carol Bonsilar, Dave's mother and uh, Norm Langland's sister. Uh, Virginia Spitters passed away last Sunday evening, and a private uh, burial service will take place earlier uh, come early this week so let's lift him up in prayer this morning for God's comfort uh, an update from Bill and Ruth Brogop uh, their daughter Kathy who uh, had underwent surgery and she is uh, slowly recovering it was a heart valve replacement surgery uh, just over a week ago and and she is hopefully home came home on Friday continued prayer for uh, Mike and Sherry Gavin's daughter, Jenny. Uh, it's just been a difficult and complicated uh, healing journey for her. And let's keep her in prayer. And then ongoing prayer for the Fletchers. Bruce and Ruth is their healing. And then uh, you received it via prayer line on Friday. Uh, let's continue to pray for Bill Coburn's sister, Nancy. His oldest sister, she lives in California. She is uh, in the ICU unit with an infection. And uh, it's looking quite precarious for her. Then I'll just add these two other announcements. Uh, this Friday is the beginning of Synod for the Christian Reformed Church. I'm going to be a delegate, uh, one of four delegates from this region attending. And uh, covet your prayers as we, we meet together, praying that uh, the Lordship of Christ would be honored and uh, the seeking of the Holy Spirit for the health and uh, vitality of the church. And then finally, uh, it's the first Sunday of June. And that means today is our birthday. It was 35 years ago this Sunday that Heritage Christian Reformed Church, which was a merger of three congregations, came together and formally became this body. And we're grateful. We're grateful for 35 years of ministry and pray for God's continued blessing as we worship here in this place and in his kingdom. Let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we glorify you as we've done this morning. We're blessing you, O oh God, for the moving and the pouring out of your Holy Spirit upon the church. We're grateful, O oh God, that through the Spirit you have called us to be one in Christ, one in faith, one in hope, because we serve one Lord. We ask, O oh God, that in our worship this morning, as, as we profess together, that uh, we would trust. We would trust deeply in the core of our being that you are sovereign. And not a hair can fall from our head without the will of our Father in heaven. Lord, may this be and continue to be an indescribable comfort to us as followers of Jesus. That through faith in Jesus, we not only would rejoice in the good news, but once again approach your throne with confidence, boldly and with great joy. Because we know you are our Father in heaven. Lord, at Pentecost, you formed us under the banner of Jesus to be your church. We praise you, O oh God, that for all those with whom we share a common faith in Jesus as Lord. In the same way, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll continue to fill us with joy and courage. Joy because of our fellowship together in Christ. Courage. Courage in these days to share the good news of what you have done, Jesus. What you are doing and what you will do on the day of your return. Come, Holy Spirit. Renew us, revive us, and refresh us, for we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Father again this week. Renew us, O God, by your mercy, that, that our lives may be a glorious doxology to the Father. And may we embrace this truth so deeply within our being that, that we do live beautiful lives for you, whether in our homes or at school, at work, and in everyday life, a life that, that others would take notice of and be moved to praise you as our Father in heaven. We pray, Holy Spirit, for your work in this church. We thank you, God, for 35 years of life and ministry together as Heritage Christian Reformed Church. Guide us, Holy Spirit, in the days to come that, that we would be faithful here in this place and wherever we go in our lives. Lord, we're so grateful for the way you have made us one. And this is so important because we live in days of great struggle. But we are sure that we are not left to our own devices. 
Grant us strength for each day that we may be faithful stewards of your word. Equip us daily with what we need to bring glory to you, Christ. Father, we pray for this community of faith, for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, and, and as we seek God's face together, we pray you would give healing, strength to those in need. Sustain them, O God, and comfort those who mourn. Lord, we pray that you would help us each to be good stewards of that which you've given us. Equip us daily with a sure and a certain hope. As we look to the coming months, may we be eager to connect with those who are far from you, Jesus. Eager to serve the needs of the least and the lost. Eager to be salt and light in this world. God, we pray that you will grant now our delight in your word as we come to that time in our service. Help us to be good students of this word. To learn again this morning what it is to mean uh, that we are, are great in the kingdom when we are the least. We are serving you, Jesus. God, we pray this not only for this church, but for our denomination, the Christian Reformed Church in North America. And as our delegates gather this coming Friday, help us to be faithful to Christ. Lord, may we be faithful in the call to serve Jesus in all we do and say. Holy Spirit, as we seek to live for Jesus as God's elect and chosen, called and equipped, help us to be a light. May the fruit of the Spirit be evident in us, that our lives may reflect your glory into the honor of Jesus' name. And we pray this in his name. Amen. A couple of announcements before we open God's Word this morning. Uh, I failed to do this last Sunday, and I apologize for doing so, but we had a, a wonderful offering uh, recently for our property upgrades, and it was notified in our newsletter and sent out via email. I just forgot to mention it last Sunday, but our goal was to raise $40,000, and thank you for your extreme, wonderful generosity. We have uh, now $56,700. So above our goal, and that will go toward uh, the completion of our parking lot project, which uh, we hope to see done uh, sometime later this month, in the month of June. So thank you for your generous and wonderful support of that. Be sure to check out our Heritage Happenings. We have some ministry things uh, to support in our community, Kalamazoo Loaves and Fishes, Alternatives of Kalamazoo as well, and you can read about that uh, here in our newsletter. Our offering this morning, which will be received as you exit our sanctuary at the end of the service, is uh, for a local kingdom work. Uh, this Sunday it is for Jesus Loves Kalamazoo. Uh, we used to be more actively involved, but we do seek to support them in this ministry. And if you're interested, go online and search for Jesus Loves Kalamazoo. They're having their Catalyst Week from July 10 through 15. And uh, you can join uh, great events in neighborhoods where you can connect with people in our community and uh, serve them, uh, which is going to be a great part of our sermon this morning as well, how to serve and love our neighbor. So all of our loose change offering this morning will go to support Jesus Loves Kalamazoo and the rest for the ongoing work of our ministry here together as we enter our, our 36th year of ministry as God's people. Those are the announcements, and now it is our privilege to spend some time in God's Word. I encourage you to open a Bible with me to the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Mark chapter 10. Gospel of Mark chapter 10, you'll find that on page 1058, according to our screen this morning, Mark 10. We're going to be looking at verses 35 through 45, just a, a little context uh, before we hear from God's Word, Jesus is uh, in the final few days of his ministry, and he is on his way to Jerusalem where uh, the greatness of God's salvation would be revealed through the cross. And as Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem, we find this passage this morning. And he's told the disciples, he, and, and we've heard you know, what, what this is all means. Jesus has explained to them he's going to go to Jerusalem He's going to be arrested and, and tried and then and crucified and on, on the third day rise again. And Mark, the gospel writer, pauses to tell us about something that happens along the way. And it's really awkward. James and John make a request of Jesus. It's kind of a thick-headed request. We're going to look at it this morning. 
we're going to find that Jesus turns it into an opportunity to talk to all of the disciples about what does it mean to be a disciple? And in light of it being Pentecost Sunday today, what does it mean to keep in step with the Holy Spirit as we seek to be disciples of Jesus today? So our passage is Mark 10, 35, 45. Let's pause here again and let's pray together and let's ask the Spirit to be at work. Please join me. Father, we pray you will quiet everything. Our to-do lists, our hope wish lists, everything that ruminates around in our hearts and minds because we're worried about the things in this week. Quiet us, Holy Spirit, that we would simply sit at the feet of Jesus to not only marvel at his teaching, but to be reminded of how it is called to direct us. Open this word for us, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verses 35. In the NIV, it is titled, The Request of James and John. Let's listen to God's Word this morning. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, that is Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And what do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other on your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink, and be baptized with the bapti baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated once again. So when we think about something being great, whether it's a person, a place, maybe it's a thing, when we think about something being great, we think about how they're set apart from the rest. We do this a lot. We do this a lot. In fact, we probably do this more often than we realize. But here's, here's a couple examples. When, when you think of the greatest baseball player of all time, you wonder, is it Mickey Mantle? Is it Barry Bonds? I don't know. Or what about, hey, maybe this is a little closer to home, being Canadian. I mean, what about the greatest hockey player of all time? I, is it Wayne Gretzky or Sidney Crosby? Both of whom are Canadians, by the way. What about the greatest musician? Ludwig van Beethoven? The Beatles? Garth Brooks, come on, I had to throw a little country music in there. Let's talk about inventions. I, I thought a little bit about this week. I mean, what's, what's the greatest invention? I know I'm somewhat limited to my time, but I'll go beyond that a minute. Maybe, maybe the printing press. And then I thought, well, penicillin. Oh, and then I thought, no, 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 no. Duct tape. Come on. You know it, Right? Uh, penicillin, great, right? But duct tape, duct tape fixes everything. Now, why do we think about great things? Well, we think about great things because, well, we're drawn to greatness. We're drawn to greatness. And, and quite frankly, I know it in my own heart, we kind of hope that greatness can be found in me. 
And that's where the pursuit of greatness, which is what we're going to talk about this morning, because that's what James and John were getting all up in Jesus' business about. We're going to talk about greatness this morning. And now we're talking not about greatness out there, because we're not unlike James and John. We're going to talk about the greatness quest inside of here, in my heart, in your heart. I want to begin on a positive note because I think it's important for us to hear this. It's important to hear this morning that seeking to live a life that is great, I mean, even a life, let's say, a life that matters is actually a God-given thing. We are, after all, made in God's image. We are created for His glory. And we're redeemed in Jesus Christ. Because here's the gospel that sings over us as followers of Jesus. We are redeemed in Jesus Christ to live for the glory of God's name. So pursuing greatness or a life that matters isn't a bad thing. But the desire, like every desire, and here we're talking about the desire for greatness, the desire for greatness is polluted by our sinful nature. And you know how this works, right? As a result, our desire for greatness doesn't always line up with God's design. And that's our James and John predicament here in our passage. We have to understand that desires are not morally neutral. And that comes into play here in our story. We find James and John, pretty well-known names in the disciple group. They desire greatness. And again, that's not all bad. But we find out here in our passage this morning that it's not the right path. Their path or their pursuit is more than their desire, but their path or pursuit of greatness isn't according, as Jesus says, it's not according to God's kingdom. Now, greatness is greatness, we might say. Who cares how somebody gets there because greatness is greatness? Well, no, that doesn't actually work. See, one way that we pursue greatness in a bad way, I'm just going to use this as an example, is too often we, we, we see greatness by comparison, not to Christ, but to somebody else. And greatness by comparison is a, is, a, is a bad deal. For example, I might think that I'm a great parent compared to an absentee parent. So it's really low. bar is put really low, and I'm here, and Maybe I'm not up there, but I'm still here, and they're there. And see, it's the bad definition. Then. Or I might say that I'm a great friend because I know friends who spread gossip about their friends, and I, I don't do that. So again, as long as I set the bar really low, and I don't come out looking so bad. But comparison greatness plans really don't work. As long as I'm better then, and it's not maybe hard to find myself being better than a few people in this world. I know I'm not the bottom of the ladder, but the problem is I'm no longer seeking to be more like Jesus. Uh, it's, it's greatness by comparison instead of greatness by Christ-likeness. Now that comparison game is part of why Jesus has an issue with James and John's request. What do they do? They ask, and, and, and it's a bold. I mean, it takes some chutzpah here, right? What a bold. I want you, Jesus, to do whatever I ask of you. And they ask to sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand. And, and it's not hard to imagine. The right hand and left hand are the seats of prominence. They're the seats of influence. They're the seats of prestige. Anytime somebody would look at Jesus, they'd say, hey, look, there's James and John. Now, before we get to what it all looks like, let's, let's talk... Let's talk about, again, some good news. Again, the first, the good news here. The good news is that James and John, though it's a, not a well-directed request, nonetheless are believing Jesus. This is actually a faith moment. A few verses earlier than our passage, it writes, Jesus says this in, in Mark 10. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come, eternal life. So, so James and John are at least believing, not sure of the journey, but believing what Jesus says here, that those who follow him and do so leaving behind everything else will gain. So there's the positive. The bad news is, and I hope you didn't miss it, 
when you heard the passage, the bad news is that John, James and John are applying a definition of greatness that is more of the world than that of Christ. It's a definition. And it's not the first time that Jesus has said to them, you know, Whoa, time out. Uh, hey, you, you, you kind of missed the boat on this one, guys. Like I said, I said a minute ago, it had to take some incredible chutzpah of these guys, of James and John, to go to Jesus and say this. They wanted the inside track. They wanted to be near the top of the totem pole. They wanted to be on the path of greatness. And who doesn't? So let's talk about their request for a minute this morning. And I want to say that we have, we've not verbally said it, but this question is our question. Because there's something in the human heart that always wants to be at the top. Because wouldn't it be great, I'm going to segue here for a minute, wouldn't it be great if I were just like James and John, sitting at the right hand and left hand of Jesus in this life? Don't you think I'd have an incredible witness? Right? We could argue from that point. Don't you think I could be a greater influence on people? And, and you can see how that kind of works out. It's a dangerous thing. Well, Jesus makes clear later in the passage, verse 42, he says, look, the path to greatness that you are on right now, or that you are pursuing, I should say, isn't the one that I'm on, Jesus' way. Because the path you're pursuing is, let's just call it the worldly definition of greatness. That's about power. It's about prestige. It's about having pull over other people, which isn't the path to greatness in God's economy. And we're going to hear about that in just a moment. Now, Jesus says, let me tell you about the Gentile world, which is a way of saying the world's greatness plan. In that plan, greatness is defined by exercising authority over others. One commentator writes of that, you know, that's not so much a criticism. It's just a description of how things work in our world. In ancient times, greatness was measured by the amount of slaves you had, or greatness was measured by how many people were under you. The more people under you, the greater your potential, the greater your power, the greater your position. Not hard to imagine, right? Sadly, sadly, that path to greatness is too often our pursuit, such as it was for James and John. It's greatness defined by whose name is on the side of a building. Or it's greatness defined by how large my donation is to a certain ministry. Or it's greatness defined by having better grades than everybody else in the class. It's, it's greatness defined by how large a company is that, that I'm, I'm working in and working for. And on the surface, those optics look great. But the problem that, that Jesus is, is drawing into here with James and John, it turns out the other ten disciples, they're indignant. Why? Because they're really on the same track, and they're kind of kind of upset that James and John kind of ache their way ahead of them. But it's a worldly path of grace. It's not the way, says Jesus. It's not the way for those who follow, follow him. Life in the, in the kingdom of God is supposed to be different. Now, I want to pause here for a minute and say success Success is not inherently wrong. There are genuine Christ followers who do have their name on the side of a building. And there are genuine followers of Jesus who are running big companies and by God's blessing have become significantly wealthy and they're very generous with it. So it's not the success issue by the worldly standard. It's the desire for greatness as a result of that success. Success is not suspect. Genuine believers know, and we're supposed to know this. We take a passage like Mark 10 and go, oh man, i got to realign my heart here. But even when the blessing of God happens to be great for you and your life or my life and, and we do accomplish great things, that's not greatness in itself. Because greatness comes when I align my life to Jesus. When I align my heart to and everything. It doesn't matter my, my social status or the color of my skin or the depth of, of my portfolio or the number of likes I get on social media. It is alignment. As I'm aligning my heart 
more and more to Jesus, then I'm on a path of greatness in God's kingdom. Now, how do you get there? Well, here in our passage this morning, there are three facets to the Christ-like path to greatness. And we're going to look at each of them. It's, it's suffering for Christ, it's service in Christ's name, and it's surrender to Christ. So I, I tried to make this as easy as possible, went to the alliteration path, okay? Suffering, service, surrender. Let's look at them. The first one, the path to greatness is rooted in suffering for the sake of Christ. Suffering for the sake of Christ. In time, James and John, they understood this. History tells us that, well, history, the book of Acts tells us that James was killed. He became a, a martyr for the faith, one of the first disciples to die as a result of following Jesus. John, John eventually ended up on the island of Patmos, exiled there. James and John would come to see how suffering for Christ is on the path of greatness. Now, countless others have done the same throughout history. I'm not saying you now need to go get martyred in order to be on the road of, of greatness. What I'm saying is what Scripture tells us, and that is that we follow the suffering Savior, and we are to be like Him, pursuing and aligning our hearts to His. Today's Pentecost Sunday, and it just fits so well, right? As we're aligning our way to Jesus, as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we recognize that suffering for the sake of Christ is a much better road to be on because it's shaping and it's defining my heart to be more like His. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, which is in, in Matthew 5, He says this in verse 11, Blessed are you. Who's He talking to? He's talking to those who understand the kingdom. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. It's not a blessing just if somebody insults you and falsely says all things about you just because. No, no, it's blessed if it's for the sake of Christ. Like, don't, don't be a jerk just for the sake of being one. No, suffer because you're willing to align your heart to the kingdom and the kingdom priorities and the kingdom principles. Let that be your desire. And Jesus picks up on that here in this passage and wants us to know that. Here's the first facet. If you want a heart that's lining up more and more to the path to real kingdom greatness, it must embrace suffering. Here's the second one. Along with suffering, the path to greatness is defined by service in the name of Christ. Jesus says here to his disciples, whoever, now all of a sudden he's, he's talking to his 12, but now he's expanding it really large. He says, whoever wants to be great. So it's not just you, James, and it's not just you, John, and Peter, and all the rest of you. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Then, and today, that's not a role that we relish. Let's be honest. Often we correlate service with servile. In other words, we have a negative or pejorative understanding of service. And that's not kingdom principle priority there. Service in Christ is vital to the path of greatness. You want to grow in greatness? I want to grow in greatness. It's going to become, as Jesus says, by being a servant. Not just the suffering aspect, but the servant. It's choosing, it's choosing to have a servant's heart in, in loving ways. For example, uh, I used earlier uh, somebody who makes some material wealth in our world and wants to know what to do with it. A servant's heart, thank God for this, works in them to say, this isn't mine. I'm just a steward. I can't take it with me. How am I going to invest it so that it's working for the kingdom? That's what a servant's heart asks. Or maybe you have a particular giftedness in hospitality. And the hospitality in you says, well, it's not just about hosting the biggest and the best in my home, but what can I be, how can I be hospitable to the least and the lonely? Whether it's giving food to the hungry or a cup of water to the thirsty or 
or as, as Jesus says in Matthew 25, uh, we're clothing the naked and, and we're looking after the sick and, and we're visiting people in prison. I mean, this is, this is the path to greatness. It's not only suffering for, it's service in the name of Jesus. Paul says in Galatians 5, you were called to freedom, but not, do, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. So we've mentioned what? Suffering and service. And now here's the third facet. I, I long for this to be more and more true of my story, and I long for this to be our story each and every day. We're growing into this. This path to greatness as, a, as followers of Jesus, as a church. And the last one is the surrender. Surrender to Christ. Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. You think service is hard. Think about this one. Ouch. Everybody knows a slave is at the bottom. And as a spiritual posture, Jesus is saying it's, it's willing to see others always as worthy, you're worthy of your love. So you're surrendering to Christ and lifting up others. Paul talks about this in Philippians 2. Because it follows the pattern of Christ. Christ who did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's surrender. And I think of the three, suffering, service, and surrender. This is the one that really gets hard. Because now everything's on the line. Everything. Am I willing, through the Holy Spirit, to surrender my will, my wants, my wallet, my walk, all of it to the Father? Here on Pentecost Sunday, it's 50 days since Jesus' resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes out. God pours it on his people. It makes them courageous. makes them strong. makes them the church. It's vital that we grasp, again, the true path to greatness in God's kingdom. Because it's a path that's going to be marked by sacrifice, suffering, and service. Surrender to Christ in every way. And when you first read a passage like Mark 10, as I am want to do sometimes too, and I'll, I'll get to the first few verses and think, boy, James and John, could, could you be more thick-headed? I'm so glad I'm not like that. Are we? Are we not? I mean, it's so easy. 2,000 years later, man, oh boy, did they ever miss it. And then think, yeah, so do I. So do I. Because we're, we're all really not that much different from, from James and John prior to the cross. And that's why those who know and, and, and trust in Christ, it's, it's why we have to come to the communion table as often as we can. Because this is where we see greatness. And all who come to the table and are eating this bread and drinking this cup, we're doing so because we are believing in this one who suffered. Who suffered painful, cruel death on the cross for our sake. Who served the Father to the very end. Because ultimately what Christ did is he surrendered his will to that of the Father. And he shows us the path to greatness. And as we're going to come to the table here in a few moments, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit is going to help us to see that. How we can rest in the finished work of Christ, the one who drank the cup of suffering, served out his life to the very last drop, and surrendered to the will of the Father. Now let's follow him. Come, says Jesus. Come to me. Follow me. Follow the Christ who is the great work of God. And then let's run that, run that race of, of sacrifice and service and surrender. Let's just keep doing that. Let's keep doing that. Because I, tr I, I, I trust, I believe that's what makes a church great. We're grateful to celebrate 35 years of ministry together as a church. It's wonderful. But we cannot rest on our laurels, as they say. There's nothing about a church that's great unless it's doing what we're talking about this morning. 
sacrificing for the sake of Christ, service in the name of Christ, and surrender to the will of Christ. He is the king after all. He is the path to greatness. To the glory of the one who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this word comes as not only hard to hear because of our own mistaken desires, but it comes as a truth that we need to hear. We pray, O God, that through the work of Christ that you will renew us again so that we would be on the path to greatness, a path that is defined by sacrifice and service and surrender to Christ. Come, Holy Spirit. Do a great work in us again this morning, even as we gather here at the table to remember and rejoice and reflect again on the greatness of your grace. Fill us as we will sing. Send us, move us for the glory of your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the central pieces to the Christian faith is the awareness that apart from God's grace, we would be forever lost in our sin. However, God spoke decisively to the problem of our mistaken desires. And God spoke decisively through his son Jesus, who lived, died, rose again, ascended to heaven, and one day will come back. So that whoever believes in him, as John tells us, Jesus tells us in John 3, will not perish, but have eternal life. This morning, as we gather here at the table, we remember this is God's gift of grace. We come to this table not as individuals only, but as a community that is formed and created by the Holy Spirit. As a community that is convinced that that this grace is what makes us whole. A people who, through through confession and accountability and community, we get to experience the full riches of fellowship. This morning as we gather here at this table, may we do so fully aware that we are a community of redeemed sinners. Confident that as we come to God, honest about who we are, He will reveal yet again who He is. A God who is full of grace and truth. People of God, as we prepare to celebrate this communion this morning, listen to the words spoken at the very first celebration with Jesus and his disciples. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. It is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul later goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 11, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With these words, Jesus commands all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup in true faith and in the confident hope of his return in glory. For in this supper, God declares to us that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself finished on the cross. He also declares that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his very body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. As Jesus said a prayer before sharing this meal, let us do the same again this morning. Please join me in prayer. With joy, we praise you, gracious God. 
For you created heaven and earth. You made us in your image. And you kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. Send now your Holy Spirit upon us. That all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice to the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus says to all of you this morning, Come. Come, all you who are truly sorry for your sins, who believe in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, who have confessed his name and desire to live in obedience to him, come. Come eagerly, come joyfully, with assurance of faith, for Christ, our risen Lord, invites us to fellowship with him here at this table. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And as this is distributed here this morning, we'll sing together some songs. Breathe on me, breath of God, and spirit of the living God.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Thanks be to God. A cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. And as this is distributed, we'll continue our worship together. the blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Thanks be to God.
Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, in gratitude, in deep gratitude for this moment, for this meal, and for this people, we give ourselves to you again. Take us out, O oh God, onto the path of greatness, which is the way of Christ. Help us to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us. Expect much from us. Enable much by us. Encourage many through us. And so, Lord, may we live to your glory and the greatness of your name as inhabitants of earth and citizens of the kingdom of heaven and members of the body of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. I invite you to stand for God's blessing. As God's holy people dearly loved, may we go this week into the world, alive in Christ, and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. And as we are going, receive God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust in him that you may overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Together, God's people say, Amen.